Remember the crux of the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate? It seems this way of thinking remains firmly entrenched in presuppositional thinking, as demonstrated by my recent conversation with S.J. Thomason. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. I recently had a conversation with S.J. Thomason. I was surprised to discover that not only is she a presuppositionalist, presuppositionalist thinking is so ingrained into her thought process that she assumes that's how everyone thinks. And I think other people are looking for it. They have their own assumptions. My assumption is that it's true, and I figure out how to reconcile it. Your assumption is that it's false. SJ claims that truth matters, yet clearly it does not. If you start from the position that you already know the truth, and you need to make the data fit your presupposition, then truth does not matter to you, only your presupposition. Presuppositionalism is defined as an assumption made beforehand, a preliminary conjecture or speculation. Now, it's possible that you are right, in which case aligning the data with the correct answer yields the correct result. However, if your presupposition was wrong, you never get to the correct answer, and you never arrive at truth. Instead, you keep trying to make the data fit your presupposition. If the presupposition is wrong, can you ever possibly arrive at truth? The answer is, only if you are willing to let go of the presupposition when the data doesn't line up with it. That's why the scientific method begins with a hypothesis, not a presupposition. And then you go about trying to disprove your hypothesis. You don't presuppose that your hypothesis is true and try to make the data fit your hypothesis. You do the opposite. You try to disprove your proposition. You try to think of what would happen if you are wrong, and then you come up with a falsifiable claim that would be true if you are wrong. And then you experiment to falsify your own hypothesis. This is why I stopped being a young earther. The young earthers told me that fish cannot grow lungs. Evolution cannot happen because fish cannot grow lungs. Then I saw lungfish. That falsified the young earth claim. It didn't prove or disprove God or evolution but it was evidence consistent with evolution. Clearly, the young earther's hypothesis was wrong. Not only can fish grow lungs, they do. S.J. admits she starts from the position that the Bible is true, yet she also admits to not being an inerrantist. That's a tricky one. So the Bible can be wrong, but on points she believes, then it can't. That's a strange way to determine truth. If I believe it, it's true. So when I present places where the Bible is inconsistent on something that she believes, the resurrection, she insists the Bible must be right, and it's just a matter of finding the correct way to see the data so that it turns out to be right. In other words, mental gymnastics. Notice how she handles the problem that I give her with the differences in the resurrection account. Multiple ways to reconcile those accounts. Mine is just one, but I've, I've seen other people reconcile them. Uh, I, unlike, well, like what I'm, I think what you might be looking for is, and I think other people are looking for it, they have their own assumptions. My assumption is that, that it's true, and I'll figure out how to reconcile it. Your assumption is that it's false. She begins with the assumption that it's true, and then she assumes that I begin with the assumption that it's false. I quickly correct her that that is not how I approach the Bible. Figure out how to reconcile it. Your assumption is that it's false, and you you think that there are contradictions that I don't no, see. No, that is not my, that's not it at all. Clearly, some things in the Bible are true. Herod the Great really was king of Judea in the first century BCE. The Persians did conquer Israel somewhere around the seventh century BCE. The Apostle Paul really did write some of the books of the Bible that are attributed to him. I don't start with the assumption that if it's in the Bible, it's false. Rather, when I see something in the Bible, I fact check it. Some things check out. 
Other things do not. This is why I am where I am today. If I assumed that everything in the Bible was true, I would never fact-check any of its claims. I did take the position that the Bible was inerrant, and I did refrain from looking at anything that said otherwise, as I thought I had the right position. But I was not so entrenched in the position as to refuse to believe facts when put before me. To look at those facts and ask, how can I fit these with what I have presupposed, as S.J. and other presuppositionalists do? Contrary to S.J.'s claim that truth matters, clearly it doesn't, as the only thing that matters to her is that she is right, that her presuppositions could possibly be true if you do enough mental gymnastics. With that in mind, let's look at how she handles the problems of the incompatibility of the resurrection accounts in the Bible. But, but I've reconciled it basically. Uh, here's, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions packed into it. So here's what I have. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene traveled to the tomb where she found it to be empty. So she went to tell the disciples, John and those who had been with Jesus, uh, wept, in, in, as reported in Mark. At dawn, according to Matthew and Luke, just after sunrise, according to Mark, she returned to the tomb with the other women, including Mary, the mother of John, and Salome, where they found the angels, according to Mark. Some of the women returned to the apostles and told them about the angels, while Mary Magdalene may have lingered. At this point, the apostles had reports from multiple women that the tomb was empty and or angels had appeared to them, according to Luke. These came from Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and others. So Peter and John ran to the tomb and confirmed it was empty, according to John. Mary Magdalene started crying in front of the angels she saw in the tomb, according to John. Then Jesus appeared to her, telling her to go back to the apostles to let them know about him. Mary, the mother of James, joined her, and they left, according to Matthew. Jesus suddenly appeared again. Perhaps this was Mary, the mother of James's benefit, for Mary, mother of James's benefit. Uh, Mary Magdalene then reported to the apostles that she had seen the risen Lord, according to Mark and John. And then so you have the reports now following from Matthew 28, 11 to 15, uh, which basically talks about what they saw. And then Jesus appeared to Clopas and another disciple, according to Mark and Luke, Luke on the road to Emmaus, and soon shared passages about himself from the Old Testament, according to Luke. But these disciples told the 11, and the 11 didn't believe them, according to Mark. Jesus rebuked the 11 for their unbelief, according to Mark. He later instructed them to make disciples of all nations, according to Matthew and Mark, and told them that whoever believes and is baptized would be saved, according to Mark. And so I just, I mean, I just think it gets put together when I think people pack assumptions into some of this stuff that, that, that require you to put it together. And her reconciliation doesn't even try to reconcile the biggest problem of the passage, the one that I gave her, the problem of the disciples meeting with Jesus on Resurrection Day in the room and being told to remain there in Jerusalem until Pentecost. But in two versions of the story, Matthew and John, they meet Jesus in Galilee. In SJ's version of the events, no one even goes to Galilee. SJ has given us an entirely new gospel account that agrees with none of the written ones in her attempt to harmonize the accounts. When the mental gymnastics require you to ignore the most glaring error in the accounts so that you can reconcile what I consider petty differences, patting yourself on the back for your success again reiterates that it isn't truth that matters. Making it possible for the book to be right is all that matters to you. You just need to stop looking at the man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great and Oz has spoken. And pretend that the great and powerful Oz really is the one speaking. Now, I never addressed this glaring problem with SJ as the conversation shifted at this point. And this is where she went into presuppositionalism, which I considered an even bigger problem for one who thinks that truth matters, then is ignoring the problem that you are trying to reconcile. Let's look at the points she did try to reconcile, the number of women at the tomb, the time of day, and who saw Jesus when. Incidentally, another point she failed to take into account and I didn't bring up was the position of the stone. In Mark, Luke, and John, the stone is already rolled away when the women arrive. But in Matthew's version, an angel of the Lord comes and rolls the stone away and then sits on it. The guards see this and are so afraid that they become like dead men. The angel sitting on the rock tells the women that Jesus is risen and to look for themselves. Then they quickly tell the disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. 
As the women are leaving with great joy, Jesus appears to them and tells them not to be afraid. Since the text just told you that they were feeling joyful, I guess Jesus' appearance must have been unsettling. Jesus then repeats the message from the angel that they are to tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee. Now listen again to S.J.'s reconciliation of the first trip to the tomb. This is what I have. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene traveled to the tomb where she found it to be empty. So she went to tell the disciples, John and those who had been with Jesus, uh, wept, in, in, as reported in Mark. At dawn, according to Matthew and Luke, just after sunrise, according to Mark, she returned to the tomb with the other women, including Mary, the mother of John, and Salome, where they found the angels, according to Mark. Some of the women returned to the apostles and told them about the angels, while Mary Magdalene may have lingered. At this point, the apostles had reports from multiple women that the tomb was empty and or angels had appeared to them, according to Luke. These came from Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and others. So Peter and John ran to the tomb and confirmed it was empty, according to John. Mary Magdalene started crying in front of the angels she saw in the tomb, according to John. Then Jesus appeared to her, telling her to go back to the apostles to let them know about him. Mary the mother of James joined her, and they left, according to Matthew. Jesus suddenly appeared again. Perhaps this was Mary, the mother of James's benefit, for Mary, mother of James's benefit. Uh, Mary Magdalene then reported to the apostles that she had seen the risen Lord, according to Mark and John. And then so you have the reports now following from Matthew 28, 11 to 15, uh, which basically talks about what they saw. And then Jesus appeared to Clopas and another disciple, according to Mark and Luke, Luke on the road to Emmaus, and soon shared passages about himself from the Old Testament, according to Luke. But these disciples told the 11, and the 11 didn't believe them, according to Mark. Jesus rebuked the 11 for their unbelief, according to Mark. He later instructed them to make disciples of all nations, according to Matthew and Mark, and told them that whoever believes and is baptized would be saved, according to Mark. And so I just, I mean, I just think it gets put together when I think people pack assumptions into some of this stuff. The first trip to the tomb was Mary Magdalene alone. She sees it empty and she goes to Peter at John. No angel speaks to her at all. She is alone. S.J. does this because in John's version, only Mary Magdalene is said to have gone, and it says that she went while it was still dark. In the other versions, the sun has already risen before the women go to the tomb. By making Mary take two trips to the tomb, S.J. has created a new problem. In Mark's version, Mary Magdalene is specifically named as going to the tomb just after sunrise. And while they are going, they ask who is going to roll the stone away. If this is Mary Magdalene's second trip to the tomb, and on the first trip she went into the tomb and saw it empty, why is she asking who will roll the stone away when she knows full well that it has already been rolled away, as she has not only seen it, but she's been inside the tomb? Next, in order for S.J.'s version to work, you need to ignore the original ending of Mark, that the women left the tomb so afraid that they told no one. Instead, you need to use only the long ending of Mark, the version that isn't in the oldest and best manuscripts, and Bibles today even tell you to take this ending with a grain of salt, figuratively, of course, as then you get Jesus first appearing to Mary Magdalene. But again, this creates more problems. First, in this version, she goes and tells the disciples, and they don't believe her. There's no mention of anyone with her on this trip, in which case she would be the only one that told the disciples about Jesus rising. But this same version, just a few verses earlier, has three women going to the tomb, and they are so afraid that they tell no one. It's obvious that whoever wrote Mark 16, 1 through 8, isn't the same person who wrote Mark 16, 9 through 20, just from this internal inconsistency alone. If these are two different trips to the tomb, reported in reverse order as S.J. would have us believe, then for the first trip, Mary Magdalene leaves with enough courage to tell the disciples, but when she sees the same sight a second time, she gets so scared out of her wits that she tells no one. How could anyone possibly think this is a rational story? Is it possible? Yes. It's also possible that unicorns ran out from the tomb on the second trip, and that's what frightened the women. But let's not deal in what's possible. Let's look at what's rational and probable. Is it rational that Mary Magdalene made two trips to the tomb? Yes, that's a possibility within the realm of reason. 
but that on the second trip to the tomb, she forgot that the stone had already been rolled away, or that she was joyful the first time she saw the empty tomb, but fearful the second time, that also defies reason. One reason most churches rejected the long ending of Mark was its position on snake handling and drinking poison. According to this passage, believers can handle deadly snakes and drink poison, and it won't hurt them. The Catholic Church has never advocated for doing this, to the best of my knowledge. I could find very little written about it, and what little I found, they don't condone it. The claim that believers can drink poison and live, or handle deadly snakes, are demonstrably false, particularly because believers have died trying to demonstrate their faith in these things. Why believe any of the rest of the passage? The passage also says that believers can lay their hands on people and heal them. If this were true, believers should have emptied the hospitals long ago. Reason tells us the entire passage is just wishful thinking. This also makes no sense. If Mary went to the tomb at dark, saw it empty, ran back, told the disciples who didn't believe her, then goes for a second time with two other women who leave afraid but tell the disciples anyway despite their fear, and the story telling us otherwise, and the disciples believe them, as they now have multiple accounts, so now they run to the tomb. Then either Mary is still there because she lingered, or this is her third trip to the tomb, and when Peter and John arrive, she is crying because she doesn't know where Jesus is, and Jesus appears to her and tells her to tell the disciples that he is risen. Okay, but she's already done this. Twice. She's supposed to go and tell them a third time? And Peter and John are already here. Why does Mary need to go tell them that Jesus is risen when they've already seen Jesus gone for themselves? And the story says they believed at this point, or at least John did. Until writing this script, I never noticed this inconsistency with the John version within itself. Why didn't Jesus tell Peter and John himself? He's right there with them. Jesus could have meant the other disciples, as in the Luke version, they thought that the women were speaking nonsense. And if they were, in fact, relating all of the events in all of the versions of the story, they would be speaking nonsense. (laughs) Conflicting stories on how they feel, where the stone is, who said what to whom, yes, it's all nonsense. But here's another problem. In the Luke version, when the disciples don't believe the women, Peter runs to the tomb to see for himself, and when he sees the empty tomb, he wonders what happened. But remember the John version? There, Peter and John saw the empty tomb, but John didn't wonder. He believed. I suppose you could make the argument that what he believed was simply that Jesus' body was gone. A couple commentaries take this position, but most say that he believed that Jesus was risen. Now, it's possible that Peter didn't at this point. He's still puzzling over why the body is gone. But when his best bud is saying he now understands what he didn't before, that Jesus had to die and rise, having seen all the evidence that Peter doesn't believe is also less plausible. In John's version, Jesus tells Mary to tell the disciples that he is ascending to heaven. That's it. That's the whole message. Nothing about meeting them, nothing about having seen him. She then runs off and tells them that she has seen Jesus. That evening, Jesus appears to the ten. Thomas isn't there and Judas is dead. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them. A week later, he comes again, and this time Thomas is there too, and he believes also. Sometime after that, he appears to the disciples. We don't know if all eleven are there or not, on a beach in Galilee. They have returned to fishing. No one is starting a church or spreading a new faith. They're just fishing, despite that they are all believers now and they have the Holy Spirit despite the fact that Pentecost isn't going to come for a few more weeks yet. Is it possible to reconcile these? Sure. A giant pegasus could have come out of the tomb and flown the disciples to Galilee and back. God could magic the disciples into a boat in Galilee with fishing nets. And when they find themselves in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, fishing is the logical conclusion of what God wants them to do. But are these reasonable? No. Why would an angel tell the women to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee if Jesus was planning to meet them in Jerusalem? Why would Jesus tell the disciples to remain in Jerusalem if the plan was to meet them later in Galilee? The problem isn't that it couldn't happen. It could. But having Jesus meet the disciples in both locations renders Jesus' words to be nonsense. 
Either that, or he isn't the omniscient God that he claims to be. Next is the problem with Jesus' body and the laws of physics. The body is physical sometimes, and not sometimes. Believers would have us believe that Jesus could choose to be in a spirit body or a physical body at will. That way, he can appear and disappear, walk through walls, and ascend into heaven at will by taking a spirit form. And then he could eat and have Thomas touch his wounds when he chose to be physical. But when Mary meets Jesus in John's gospel, Jesus tells her not to cling to him or not touch him, depending on the translation. What this means, even believers don't know, as the commentaries acknowledge many ideas on what this might mean. If it means that Jesus hadn't yet joined to his physical body, as I was taught in church, then why is the body missing from the tomb? Where is it? If Jesus can will his body to be spirit when needed, where does the physical body go? If he obliterates it, then Jesus has physically died many times. If it magically is transported to another location for temporary storage, what possible purpose is there in bringing it back? And where does it go? Does God have some cosmic body locker somewhere in space? This is confusing about believer deaths as well. If believers go to heaven to get a spiritual body, while the physical body rots in the grave, why would they want the rotten physical body back at Jesus' return in the rapture? They would go from being spirits to being zombies. If I had a perfect body that felt no pain, I sure as hell wouldn't want this one back. I don't think people who believe in the rapture have thought this one through. If Jesus' body gets destroyed every time he goes into spirit mode, does the matter get destroyed? Or is it just blown to atomic particles too small to see? Does Jesus feel pain in this process? If Jesus' physical body transubstantiates into the Eucharist, does he feel pain when people eat his body and drink his blood? If not, can you really say that they are his body? Where does all the energy come from, and where does it go with all of these transmutations? I know. Magic. Mystery. It's all magic and mystery. Which is my point. None of this can happen without a lot of magic going on. And I realize you worship an alleged magical super being that can allegedly do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. You claim that he loves people and wants what's best for them, but somehow that doesn't include doing what would bring about the most good, like healing them, feeding the hungry, or bringing lasting peace and health. Nope. For real problems, we are on our own. The magic is only for the ridiculous charades, like floating into the sky, or appearing to people and giving them pointless, contradictory directions on what to do. I refer to the disciples being told to go to Galilee to meet him and then seeing him the same day in Jerusalem. Is all of this possible? Sure. With the magic, it's all possible. Is it reasonable? No, not at all. But hey, if you want to serve an unreasonable God, knock your socks off. But don't tell me that truth matters to you. Clearly, it does not. Live your life.